Oh, here he is, Dakhan. We are live now, so let's deal with it. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Hala, hala, hayalla. Hassan, do you see the uh, presentation? Yes, yes, I can see. Okay. Uh, it is uh, one o'clock uh, Chicago time, uh, 9 p.m. Uh, in Riyadh. Salam alaikum, uh, Jamian. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, registering and attending uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, I think it's going to be very interesting. We uh, will be talking about uh, whether we should anticoagulate all patients or group of patients with uh, COVID-19 uh, induced respiratory failure. The uh, evidence is uh, accumulating. We have more uh, reports now. We have uh, some publications. Uh, preprints and uh, they will be presented uh, during this webinar. Just wanted to say that uh, uh, the webinar is uh, live uh, uh, broadcasted uh, on YouTube uh, at the ICU channel. So if you want to forward the link to people, it would be great. And uh, at the end, we'll have questions and answers. Uh, you can submit the question uh, through the QA section of uh, the Zoom platform. And if you want to uh, ask a question uh, and you want to talk, just raise your hand and I will uh, give you the mic so you can ask the question. We'll uh, make it more interactive. Hopefully we will have time for it, enough time for all the questions. I'm very happy to meet again with uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Fra Abu Shala and Dr. Hawa. I will uh, present them now, introduce them now, and then uh, we will have our presentations. Uh, of course, uh, my name is Mazen Kerala. I'm an uh, infectious disease and critical care medicine uh, specialist. Uh, I am the uh, Medical Director of Critical Care Services at uh, Sanford Health System. I'm Associate Professor at University of North Dakota. Dr. Nabil Abushala is uh, a Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine uh, Consultant. Uh, he's an Associate Professor at the University of North Dakota, and he's uh, a consultant at uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center. Uh, Dr. Hawa, Hassan Hawa, is a, a critical care and acute medicine consultant uh, from England. Uh, he works uh, at, uh, uh, I'm not sure how to say it, uh, Walls All or Walls All. Walls Hospital. All yes. Thank you very much. In England and King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center. So uh, myself, I'm located in Chicago right now. Dr. Abu Shala is in uh, North Dakota, Fargo. And uh, uh, Hassan Hawa is in, is it Birmingham or, uh, or uh, London? Yeah, Birmingham, Birmingham. So, and uh, wherever you are, uh, good afternoon or good evening. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I will be uh, 
talking about uh, basic pathophysiology of what we understand about this disease so far. Dr. Abu Shala will uh, put the rationales for anticoagulation and Dr. Hawa will uh, enlighten us of uh, what uh, uh, we will be doing in the intensive care uh, for those patients. Uh, I want to start by saying that it is our privileges and obligations to, uh, to care for those patients. I know it's been tough for everyone who works in the ICU and uh, I want to uh, uh, send my best regards for everyone. Uh, I think uh, uh, we need to do this together and we're building knowledge uh, and uh, we're getting more information so we understand the disease in a better way now and we'll be able to manage those patients in a better way. You probably have seen my uh, YouTube uh, video about uh, an update uh, on the pathophysiology of severe COVID-19 cases. And uh, I want to start by saying that uh, what we understand so far that the virus uh, gets into the cells through the ACE2 receptors. After uh, attachment, somehow there is imbalance between the uh, effects of the products uh, of uh, ACE1 and products of ACE2. And that will lead to uh, vasodilatation at the uh, pulmonary vasculature level. And also will incite uh, a cascade of inflammation and uh, uh, cellular uh, along with uh, humoral immunity. The uh, end results uh, with the cellular immunity is that we activate those cells and we'll have a uh, number of cytokines, uh, mainly the uh, IL-6 that uh, will cause a direct injury on the lungs uh, and will have the acute lung injury that's been described. And uh, we know that uh, we're dealing with a spectrum of disease. It is not uh, uh, like ARDS uh, that we are used to. In the early phases, most of those patients are actually presenting with uh, a low VQ uh, ratio secondary to vasodilatation. So we have more perfusion than in normal cases and the ventilation uh, is normal. So what we have is vasodilation at the pulmonary vasculature, and we think this vasodilation is caused by the uh, uh, dysregulation of pulmonary vasculature uh, as a result of imbalance between the uh, uh, products of ACE1 and ACE2, mainly the uh, lack of uh, angiotensin 1.7 and angiotensin 1.9. This will lead to hypoxemia, and uh, there is uh, abolishment of uh, hypoxic vasoconstriction because of the vasodilatation. And the patient will have to breathe uh, harder with larger tidal volume, and his work of breathing is increased. That will lead to an increased intra, uh, transpulmonary pressure. On top of that, we know that the respiratory drive in those patients is uh, stimulated, is high, and that will lead to more increase in the work of breathing for those patients. As a result, that large swings in the transpulmonary uh, pressure will lead to patient self-inflicted lung injury in association with the direct effect of the virus on the, uh, uh, on the uh, inflammation in the lungs that will lead to alveolar lung injury. At the same time, we learned that we are dealing with uh, dead space disease where the uh, VQ is high, where we have areas of the lungs that are ventilated, not perfused. This is the result of micro and macro thrombosis that have been described and that will be what we, what we will be talking about. In case we progress into the acute lung injury, the uh, VQ ratio is going to be very low because now we have a low ventilation 
on top of the increased perfusion. This will manifest in different ways on the chest X-ray. And you've seen those X-rays where in the uh, early stages where we have the low VQ or what we call now phenotype L, those patients will have minimal infiltrates, mainly focal opacities of peripheral distribution. Once they progress to acute lung injury or ARDS-like picture, they would have bilateral pulmonary infiltrates similar to what we see on, in patients with ARDS. And those would be defined as phenotype H or high, and we'll talk about that. And patients with uh, dead space disease or high VQ ratio, they may have a normal X-ray or may have evidence of uh, pulmonary infarctions, wedge shape uh, opacities or anything that uh, may be consistent uh, with uh, pulmonary infarctions or uh, embolism. And most of the cases would be no additional opacities on those patients. If you do CT scans, uh, what you see in the uh, low VQ uh, patients or the phenotype L is the ground glass opacities, mainly in the peripherally. And if you uh, uh, calculate the shunt fraction divided by the gasless fraction, so we have areas of the lungs that are normally ventilated and areas of the lungs that are uh, shunting blood. So the shunt fraction divided by the gasless fraction would be much more than one. In one study of uh, Dr. Gattinoni that was uh, measured at 3.0. In comparison to patients with ARDS, usually this uh, fraction is around one or 1.25 in the same study. In the phenotype H, uh, you can see the progression of uh, the CT scan where uh, we will have bilateral pulmonary infiltrates uh, consistent with uh, more diffuse disease uh, or ARDS-like picture. And this is uh, from uh, uh, the study that was published uh, uh, two days ago about, uh, uh, about uh, increased uh, microthrombi in those patients. Uh, and they have this CT scan list uh, in their study. And it shows the uh, lung parenchyma that is uh, involved with the COVID-19 uh, infiltrates associated with uh, pulmonary embolism in the pulmonary vasculature. So you can see filling defects in the pulmonary vasculature on the CT scan in patients with uh, macro thrombosis. Those are the CT scans taken from uh, Dr. Gattinoni's uh, study where uh, it shows here the uh, uh, ground glass opacities and uh, the relatively normal uh, uh, gas uh, uh, in the alveoli or in the lungs compared to the right side here where you see more consolidation areas of the lungs that are uh, full with infiltrates uh, secondary to the acute lung injury. This way we define uh, three different pathologies in the lungs of those patients. On the left side, the low VQ, since the lung parenchyma is relatively normal, so those patients will have the uh, low elastance. The compliance is normal. When we say low elastance, that means that it's normal. They will have low VQ because of the increased perfusion. Since there is not much lung edema, uh, the lung weight will be normal uh, or low compared to the other uh, phenotype. And those patients will not respond usually to recruitment because there is nothing to recruit. So we called it uh, uh, low recruitability. And since there is nothing to recruit, those patients will not uh, benefit from higher P, so they would require low P. And this way, that uh, phenotype is called phenotype L because everything is low here. In comparison to the phenotype H, which uh, is associated with high elastance, low compliance, there is a high ratio of uh, right to left uh, shunt 
the uh, long wait will be high because uh, of the long edema. And those patients will likely go on to uh, respond to recruitment maneuvers, and they will require higher PEEP than the patients with phenotype L. We will elaborate more on the middle part, which is the main, uh, the core uh, uh, interest of uh, our uh, webinar here is uh, those patients who are presenting with uh, evidence of uh, what we call sepsis-induced coagulopathy. And they are at risk of uh, micro or uh, macro uh, thrombosis. It is very important to uh, look at the work of breathing because that's what uh, might determine the progression from phenotype L to phenotype H. And the best way to monitor those patients would be by putting esophageal uh, uh, probe and uh, measure the intrathoracic uh, pressure. However, this is not available in many places and it's very difficult to do, especially if the patient is not uh, intubated yet. If you have a central line in the uh, subclavian or the IJ, you can uh, notice uh, large swings in the CVB if the work of breathing is high for that for those patients. But most of the time, what you have to rely on is uh, the clinical detection of work of breathing for those patients, the uh, use of accessory muscles and uh, the uh, uh, respiratory rate along with the uh, amount of tidal volume that, that they are taking. If the patient is intubated and your machine is able to measure the intrathoracic pressure at uh, 0.1 seconds, what we call P0.1, at that time you can uh, uh, detect uh, an increased respiratory drive in those patients. If the number is higher than four, uh, that would be consistent with increased respiratory drive, especially that can actually monitor those patients when you start uh, weaning. So this is the background of uh, uh, the pathophysiology that we are working with in this disease. And uh, I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Abu Shala, where he's going to tell us more about the uh, coagulation profile in uh, uh, these patients and how we're going to be monitoring and detecting those patients who might benefit from further management that we'll be talking about by Dr. Uh, Hassan Hawa. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing now so Dr. Abushala can share your uh, slides. Uh, I guess good evening for you. Um, if you are in uh, overseas in Riyadh, um, uh, I'm really delighted to be part of this group to uh, discuss what we are learning about uh, the, the role of coagulopathy or excessive thrombosis in patients with COVID-19. Um, um, and I, today, I think I want to show this slide uh, um, to show what level of evidence we will be talking about. Uh, I think uh, every one of us have seen have been inundated with a number of articles, papers, uh, posts everywhere on social media. So as, as level of evidence, as you can see here, uh, this is sort of the tip of the pyramids. Uh, and I wanted to mention uh, that most of the things that have been published are basically at the bottom of this evidence curve, evidence pyramid, which is a case series of case reports, or editorial and expert opinion. And I think we need to be wary that none of the recommendations we will discuss today are really evidence-based or strongly recommended. It is based on our experience. We know this is a new disease, we're learning about it. And I believe that most of the randomized controlled trials and the strong evidence is gonna come up by the time, hopefully that disease will be under control. So we have to use what we have. Uh, and this is the data that I will share with you uh, today. So I think with this caveat, keep in mind that everything we, we are learning about this disease and, and experts are talking about it. Uh, so it depends on how, uh, what's the number of patients that you see and how you know, famous that person, things can be uh, um, strongly recommended. Um, so when we look at the, 
cascade of what things can be done for patient uh, with COVID-19, various uh, um, modalities for treatment uh, have been used. And so today we're really gonna concentrate on the anticoagulation part. Uh, every aspect there has its own publications and recommendations and will be beyond our talk today. Uh, so with the anticoagulation, I think we can look at uh, what is called now COVID-19 associated coagulopathy. Um, and most of it is has to do with what lo looks like a DIC picture. So um, the, uh, the International uh, Society of Thrombosis um, and, him, um, and uh, uh, have recommended sort of a definition how we define uh, DIC secondary to sepsis. And, and that's, that's a description has been used in many of the papers. So what we see is, is uh, we have this sort of micro um, uh, thrombosis at the level with the activation of the clotting factors and the platelets. We see an organ ischemia. Uh, I believe even on the news yesterday, they were showing some of the new signs of, or, or the signs of COVID-19 is to see these petechiae. We can see some uh, micro thrombosis on the, on the digits, hands and feet. Um, so this process has been defined to us as physicians on the bedside by doing these steps, the, the D-dimer, the fibrinogen, the prolongation of PT and PTT, and the low platelet count. Uh, and uh, so from this, I think it's, we go to the first uh, large study, and most of the studies were from uh, Wuhan uh, area in China. And this looks at patients that were admitted so we're looking at the clinical course and risk factors of mortality. We looked at patients that were admitted with um, COVID-19 pneumonia to the hospital. Uh, this study had really a high mortality. Uh, about 25% uh, of these patients that were admitted uh, uh, died. So they looked retrospectively at all the patients and looked at which things could, you know, could help us in a, in a in a, a multi-regression analysis, which, which factors of blood tests would predict that these patients were likely to die. And I think one of those, I mean, I think everybody's familiar with the lymphopenia here, uh, but I, the one that we wanna talk about today is, is the, the D-dimer. You notice here the difference between non-survivors and survivors, we see a significant rise. This is over time, and you not notice that the D-dimer start rising on day four, and then, but most patients would rise by day seven, and then it reaching a very high level. So it's really not, not, have not been reported before, even with sepsis induced DIC. So the other one uh, from the same area by Dr. Tang, um, and uh, looking at abnormal coagulation parameters associated with poor prognosis. Again, they looked at their mortality here is lower. Uh, and again, I think it's depending on how the study was formatted, what type of pneumonia, but here they have 11% mortality in their study. And they again looked retrospectively to analyze which of these tests would predict death. And they looked at these coagulation parameters. Um, so from these, uh, if we look at non-survivors and we look at the coagulation parameters of these uh, novel uh, COVID-19 pneumonia patients. So they all had to have pneumonia. They all had to have respiratory failure. Um, and if you notice here, the remarkable ones was the prolongation of prothrombin time and their study, they use second rather than INR. And we see here an increase more than 1.7 seconds. Uh, the second one would be an elevation of the D-dimers. Uh, we see that more often with a significant P-value and the fibrin degradation product. So three factors, PT, D-dimer, FDP, are associated significantly with non-survival. So when, when you look at this, this is how they, they use the grading system. And uh, this may help us, I believe, when Dr. Howe is going to talk about implication of therapy, how do we decide which patients, if we're going to anticoagulate. Uh, so this is one of the ways that uh, they used as a grading system. They gave points to decide about the IC. Uh, and this is looking at what I mentioned, the, the, uh, the definition of the IC criteria. If you have more than five points, this is platelets, D-dimer, fibrinogen, and prolongation of PT. 
and then each one has a point. And all of these are available in the papers um, and, and that you can see how they define it, how you can grade your patients and, and see if they meet the DIC score more than five. Now, the, the puzzling study that uh, uh, was shared with us from Dr. Hawa yesterday, uh, and that was just recently published. And again, I wanna say here, it is an unedited accepted proof. Uh, this is going to be published in the Intensive Care Medicine Journal. Uh, it's a French study. Now, uh, this looks again at, uh, it's, it's in the area of Strasbourg. So this is Western France. Um, and they have uh, four ICUs, two hospitals. And the remarkable thing in this study uh, where they looked at the risk of thrombosis and again, what parameters, they had 150 patients. Now here, the caveat that all the patients had ARDS. Uh, so they studied ARDS patients, not just patients admitted to the hospital and not just ICU patients. So they had to have ARDS for French hospitals. And they found by screening these patients that 42% of them have some sort of thrombotic complications. These complications here, if you look at the thromboembolic complications, the most of them were pulmonary embolism. And this is despite the use of prophylactic uh, heparin in those patients, for the majority of time they were receiving low molecular weight heparin. So you see pulmonary embolism, 25 uh, cases, which is what 16%, then they had some DVT, they had a stroke, they had limb ischemia, mesenteric ischemia. Uh, and what was remarkable is, and I think this has been observed in many centers in Italy and in the US, that these patients require CRRT because of the high incidence of renal failure. And you notice here that, there, that the need or the clotting of the filter occurs almost 97% of the time. So the filter normally lasts about three days and those patients with COVID-19 lasts about one day. Uh, and they felt like adequate uh, filter um, management we're using local anticoagulation is not enough and these patients needed higher doses of anticoagulation. And then the same thing applies to the ECMO oxygenator. They also had a significantly increased uh, number of uh, thrombotic complications. So when we look here, the odds ratio in those patients to have a PE is 15 times compared, they compared their patients to a historical control of what they call the non-COVID ARDS. So they had 233 patients from the database. So they compared them and showed that the, this is what we usually see in our ICUs, about maybe one to 2% of PEs. So the ratio, the odds ratio of having a PE if you have a COVID-19 ARDS is 15 times compared to non-COVID ARDS. And the incidence of stroke is three times. Uh, and I think that's been the observation. Now, this is the thing that, there, that makes this study unique compared to the others is that the coagulation studies. So again, this is a selected ARDS patient uh, admitted that they, the high D-dimer was elevated. They had high fibrinogen, uh, but 96% did not have the IC based on the definition that we discussed uh, earlier. And also 88% of them had positive tests for lupus anticoagulant. Uh, and makes you wonder, is this related to the population? Are we getting a false positive test because of COVID-19? I don't think that's part of our screening test, but maybe we should look into this based on this paper. I mean, this is a good number of patients and we should look at these patients that may have either uh, uh, because none of these patients were screened before, so we don't know if they truly had lupus anticoagulant before this event. So um, now we move to the uh, way that this may help us again. This is looking at D-dimer from tank study. Uh, this is published in the Lancet. And here we look at how D-dimer changes over time and how it separates non-survivors from survivors. Again, you see this sort of peak, the rise starts on day four. Uh, and then, but most patients would take off by day seven. Uh, so this is, this is the mean increase, and this is the most of the patient, more than 90% of the patients would have a significant increase in their D-dimer level uh, on day seven. And then this is a very big separation. You can see how the D-dimer remains normal. So very few patients that have no elevation of D-dimer die. It's about 0.6% compared to 
most of the patients that uh, non-survivors have elevated DDAP. So it seems to be that this is a really the test to do to predict, uh, to help you with prognosis and maybe with management. Now, um, I wanted to show a couple of the autopsy studies. Now, these are very small numbers uh, of patients. So this is the, one of those is from New Orleans. And New Orleans was hit pretty hard uh, because they did have in Mar at the end of February, uh, they had their Mardi Gras, which was, a, you know, as you know, it's a crowded place in the French corner. Um, so they had very high numbers, and I believe their hospitalization mortality per capita is the highest in the nation here in the U.S. So when you look at their death, uh, the case fatality rate was 5%, uh, 239 death, and then the, the death among hospitalized patients was 18%. So again, uh, uh, this is a, a, a high uh, mortality. This is everybody that was hospitalized. So they did an autopsy on four decedents. So only four patients. And again, so keep that in mind. And, that's, uh, and all these patients were African-American. They all had hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. Uh, what, and they wanted to see what correlates between the findings uh, on these autopsies and their blood tests. And almost all of them had elevated ferritin, and they also had markedly elevated D-dimers. So if we look at the pathology, uh, you can see how these lungs look uh, hemorrhagic. They're red, they're inflamed, uh, and they had uh, grossly evidence of uh, increased weight. So they're wet lungs uh, with hemorrhagic changes. You can look at the heart and I think clearly see how the right ventricle seems to be dilated with the D-shaped appearance. So they had RV dysfunction and RV fader, finally compared to the left side, which is what we classically see in patients with uh, some time acute PE on the echocardiography. And what is interesting here on the gross, you see these white arrows. Uh, so these are sort of visible thrombi uh, that we're seeing. These are PEs. Majority of these were present in the periphery, and it makes me wonder whether these early ground glass changes that we see in patients later become, uh, they were microthrombosis uh, because renal pulmonary infarct can look like, like ground glass opacities, and they progress to, uh, to become a thrombotic areas, uh, because that's the remarkable thing about this disease. Now, this is the microscopy of these uh, patients. And again, if you look at it, this is the classic ARDS changes uh, um, over time. This is uh, the, the early hyaluron membranes and as it progresses here to fibrosis. So something happening with, we know in patients that have um, ARDS induced by this COVID-19 is that uh, the fibrinolytic system, the one that prevents the fibrosis in the lung, is uh, sort of overwhelmed by the COVID-19 virus. So patients will go on to develop severe fibrosis, and the, our normal system to combat this sort of uh, inflammatory cascade is overwhelmed by the COVID-19. So these patients develop severe fibrosis and reach this uh, sort of uh, aggregation of fibrosis and, uh, uh, and lymphocytes. So uh, this is an entity that it seems to be unique from their pathology report that the thrombotic microangiopathy seems to be restricted to the lungs in these autopsy series. Um, even though now we're learning that you can see evidence of peripheral ischemic changes too, but the majority, all these patients had restricted changes in the lungs. And then the last uh, autopsy series I wanted to share with you, this is a larger number of patients. This is from Japan. Um, and in Tokyo, they had uh, 36 of the 51 patients had pulmonary microthromboembolism. So they had 36, uh, 51 patients who had autopsy uh, in Japan. Um, and that's, that's a good number to learn from. Uh, and so again, as you can see in this lung, the, although there are areas of, uh, of abnormalities, but if we do look at it, these patients did not have gross emboli PEs, but they had microthrombosis. Zabit, this is, this is uh, before, before COVID-19, is that correct? Uh, this is from 1999 study. So this is comparison with the... Uh, uh, right. With, yes, mm -hmm. just to... Yeah. Okay. The 1990, yes, yes. Um, so the, the, 
the, the, the association here between thromboembolism and, and the hypercoagulable state, they looked at what tests would predict the presence of microthrombosis. And we see that the prothrombin time in their study uh, was, was the only um, test that was uh, statistically significant to predict thrombosis. Um, so D-dimer was not uh, an, a significant factor. So in this study, if you have a, a cutoff level of an INR of 1.7, this has a high specificity for the presence of microthromboemboli. Now, does that mean that we should anticoagulate patients that have an INR more than 1.7? It's difficult to tell. This is all uh, sort of association uh, findings from this autopsy series. Um, so I'm gonna stop here um, and uh, believe, uh, we'll see how we can you know, take this, uh, this information and use it for uh, our management on day to day with these COVID patients. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nabil. Um, I would like to share my screen now. Can you stop uh, sharing, uh, Nabil? If, uh... Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nabil. That was fascinating. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's my utmost pleasure to share this platform with my dear uh, friends, Mazin and Nabil. And you'll be glad to know that I don't have many slides because obviously uh, they left the easiest part of the talk to the youngest member of the, of the group. Um, so I'll be talking about, uh, uh, do we have to, or do we need to anticoagulate uh, COVID all COVID-19 patients? Uh, I would like to start by echoing what Nabil was saying at the start of his uh, presentation, that really we don't have robust evidence as yet about how to tackle the COVID-19. But uh, luckily the evidence is uh, mounting and hopefully in the next few weeks, maybe a few months, we'll start seeing uh, good quality evidence on what works for COVID-19 and what doesn't. Okay, I thought I'll just start by uh, reminding everyone that the prevalence of DVTs uh, among patients in medical ICUs is quite high. And in one of the older studies, uh, they reported up to one third of patients on the medical ICU could develop uh, DVT. And that's obviously before the era of universal uh, VTE prophylaxis. And in this study that uh, was conducted by uh, Prof. Arabi, uh, he found after the era of uh, universal DVT prophylaxis, still there is around 4.2% of patients get uh, DVT um, inside uh, medical ICUs. Um, one thing I would like to mention that it seems there's racial difference in the incidence of DVT between different group of uh, uh, ethnic uh, groups. And here, this is a study showing that in a surgical uh, Thai ICU, the incidence of uh, DVT was only 3.6, which is far less than what's been reported in the West. And we'll see the point of this slide in a minute. Now, um, this article uh, by Tang, again, uh, anticoagulant treatment is associated with decreased mortality in severe coronavirus uh, disease 2019 uh, patients with coagulopathy. And here, um, it's a retrospective study and they were proposing that we, uh, with the use of uh, uh, heparin, uh, the mortality probably would be less uh, for these patients. Uh, one thing they have used to decide who to give the treatment uh, has been the sepsis-induced coagulopathy score, which again, it's another score that was developed by the International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis, where they included the platelets count. And if the patient's platelets count were less than 100, then your patient would score two on this score. If it was 100 to 150, then the patient would score one. 
the INR or the PT was invo uh, included in this score as well. And if it was more than 1.4, then your patient would score two. If less than that, then the patient would score one. Uh, SOFA score was uh, included uh, as well. And if your patient scores two or more on the SOFA score, then that will count as two points. And this was uh, modified after the sepsis uh, three definition. And that's why they included the SOFA score uh, in, in this score. So really any patient who scores four points or above uh, in the context of sepsis, then you can safely say that this patient has got sepsis-induced coagulopathy. The beauty of these scores, it unifies um, the type of patients that you're talking about. And when you mention it to anyone elsewhere, they will understand immediately what you're talking about. So they use this score uh, in the study and uh, they, they screened 1,786 consecutive patients. So it was a, uh, in this study, they eliminated 1,261 patients. And the bottom line, they 449 classified as severe COVID-19 patients. They uh, looked into their uh, response or they, how they behaved uh, with the heparin treatment. So 99 patients uh, were treated with heparin for seven days or longer, and 350, the remaining, uh, they, were, they didn't receive any treatment, or they received heparin for less than seven days. So for those uh, who had uh, the heparin, uh, 30 patients uh, died within 28 days, uh, whilst uh, one or four patients died uh, within 28 days amongst those who didn't receive heparin for seven days. And we can see really there is no difference between the two groups. So probably I can stop here and say, there's no evidence at the moment for using uh, heparin uh, for patients with COVID-19. However, the, uh, the investigators looked deep into their patients and they, when they analyzed their patients according to the sepsis-induced score, they noticed something really fascinating for those who uh, had uh, SIC score more than four points, uh, the mortality was significantly lower in those who received heparin compared to those who didn't with significant p-value. The other important point they noticed uh, when they looked into D-dimer, those patients who had a six-fold increments in their D-dimer, uh, they had significantly lower mortality uh, if they received heparin compared to those who didn't. And this is uh, the graph illustrating the same point. And in conclusion of that study, a relatively high mortality of severe COVID-19 is worrying. Our study suggests that anticoagulant may not benefit to the unselected patients. Instead, only the patients meeting SIC criteria or with markedly elevated D-dimer may, may benefit from anticoagulant therapy, mainly with low molecular weight heparin. They did admit that further prospective studies are needed to confirm this uh, result. And I, I take a few issues with this uh, uh, study. Uh, to mention a, a few, it seems that VTE prophylaxis does not seem to be the norm in Chinese ICU. And after reviewing the evidence or the incidence of DVT uh, or VTE in Asian population, probably it would be understandable uh, that that's not that's something they would consider normally for, for their ICU patients. Uh, at the time of reporting, they mentioned 70.2% were still alive in the ICU. So really what happened to them after that time? Could we be certain that the mortality had not changed by the end of their ICU stay? And I really think a follow-up uh, report on this study is necessary uh, to make sure uh, that the data they mentioned can be uh, widely uh, applied. Moving to the rest of the world, um, this is uh, from University of Miami, kind of recommendation about therapeutic anticoagulation should be strongly considered in COVID-19 patients. So they said at high risk 
of coagulopathy, including CRRT and ECMO, we should give anticoagulation uh, or strongly consider. We should strongly consider anticoagulation in those patients demonstrating signs of micro uh, thrombi-induced organ dysfunction. For those with documented or strongly suspected macro thromboembolism, and they mentioned of note, some centers are therapeutically anticoagulating all patients on admission. Uh, when no absolute contraindication exists. So this was from the University of Miami, kind of, if you like, uh, uh, general recommendation given to their uh, intensivist. Uh, what about uh, Mass General Hospital? Well, we read, we read with interest what they said about uh, uh, anticoagulation for these patients. And they did say at this time, we do not suggest escalating prophylactic dose of anticoagulation. This probably needs to be revised by Mass General, uh, especially the evidence is mounting as uh, Dr. Nabil had shown us uh, in, his, uh, in the studies that he presented. They did suggest limiting therapeutic anticoagulation to the following, following COVID-19 patients. The usual ones really documented VTE pre-hospitalization management with therapeutic anticoagulation. So there is nothing new uh, in that. Uh, Consent for PE, they were saying this is a challenge given the inherent uh, hypoxia and disturbed coagulation profile in COVID-19 patients. So they did, they did suggest consider PE in the, in the case of marked or increasing, uh, marked increase or rising the dimer from uh, before, uh, acute worsening of oxygenation. So you have someone who deteriorating immune in terms of oxygenation, then probably you should consider uh, PE. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, standard diagnostic evaluation, CTPA or ECHO, may not be possible, and that's quite understandable. These patients are quite sick. They are really uh, very hypoxic on very high settings on the ventilator, and any movement can uh, send them uh, off. Uh, in addition to that, uh, some people are worried about uh, the uh, dissemination of the virus, but I think the clinical stability of the patient is the main factor in preventing us from moving these patients out. So they are trying to suggest to work around this, try to do ultrasound. And if you find a Doppler ultrasound of the legs, if you find DVT, then you are home and dry and you can start for anticoagulation on that ground. Uh, if not, then you might want to consider a bedside echo and see if there's any evidence uh, of acute, uh, otherwise unexplained right heart strain or intracardiac thrombus then obviously here you can go with full uh, dose anticoagulation. Uh, if you were unable to use uh, either and still concerned about this, then probably uh, treating with full dose anticoagulation unless contraindication and contraindicated over obtaining any diagnostic testing. So they are trying, I think, to say, if you have really uh, high suspicion, then proceed. Moving to the other side of the Atlantic here in London, the Imperial College uh, disseminated this recommendation, which I, I think is one of the most robust uh, recommendations so far, because they took into consideration two factors. They took the level of the D-dimer as well as the weight of the patient. So if you have someone with uh, a D-dimer less than one thousand nanogram, uh, and a weight of less than 100 kilogram, then probably enoxaparin of 40 milligrams once daily will be enough. If the weight is higher than that, 100 to 150, then probably you can double the dose of the enoxaparin. And if you have extreme obesity, then probably the enoxaparin should be 60 milligram twice daily. Then if you have uh, uh, D-dimer in the range of 1,000 to 3,000 nanogram uh, per milliliter, then again, uh, for those uh, weight less than 100 kilogram, instead of using once daily, then now you use twice daily in oxaparin. If they were 100 to 150 kilograms, then probably we should use double that dose, 8 milligrams twice daily. And for extremely obese patients, then you should use really high dose, almost therapeutic, enoxaparin of 120 milligram twice daily. They are suggesting if the D-dimer was extremely high, 
then probably you should use tenzaparin 175 units per kg once daily. In conclusion, uh, I think we are still learning about COVID-19 and hopefully we will be flooded with the robust evidence in the due course. We should have low threshold for doubling the prophylactic dose of anticoagulation, whether it's low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. As it is difficult to establish venous thromboembolism diagnosis beyond Doppler ultrasound and echo, we must have strong grounds for starting therapeutic dose of anticoagulation as the risk of bleeding is higher than usual with COVID-19 patients. We have uh, in one of the local hospital, a case be reported to, to the group, uh, a patient developed intracranial hemorrhage uh, when they gave uh, empirical therapeutic anticoagulation. And they think the combination of hypercapnia, the intracerebral vasodilatation has contributed significantly to this. And I think the group from London as well reporting similar cases of intracranial uh, hemorrhage. Uh, with this, I'll stop and I'll give the mic back to Nazim. Well, thank you very much, Hassan. Uh, this is uh, very uh, good. I uh, do have a question, a direct question to you and to Dr. Abu Shala before we can look at the questions that uh, are posted on, uh, on YouTube channel. The answer should be yes or no. Mm -hmm. Do you anticoagulate all your patients who come to the intensive care unit, regardless of any criteria? Prophylaxis we're talking or no? therapeutic? Therapeutic anticoagulation. Oh, no. <laughs> For me, it's no, I don't know about no, the but... second question. Do you anticoagulate patients based on criteria? You can put in it D-dimers above 3,000, signs of uh, organ dysfunction, such as hypoxemia or uh, acute kidney injury. Do you do that, yes or no, in your place? Um, no, without really strong evidence at the moment, we are not giving therapeutic antibiotics. Okay, my next question is, what is the mortality rate in your limited experience? Are you seeing those <laughs> patients dying? Uh, that's a fascinating question. Uh, definitely we are seeing some uh, people dying uh, on our unit. Uh, I'm glad to report that uh, in, the, in the UK there's the uh, ICNARC uh, data collection, the Intensive Care Audit and Research uh, Group, which reports weekly and our mortality is really within the average across the country, which is around 60% uh, for those COVID patients coming to the ICU. Having said that, this includes mechanically ventilated patients, I mean invasively ventilated and non-invasively ventilated patients. Right. Once the patient hit the ventilator, then the mortality is substantially higher than that. And that's what we experienced here also in the States. Ventilated patients' mortality is getting a range of like 50 to 70% dependent on uh, the uh, age group that you're looking at. But at least 50% of patients on mechanical ventilation in the two studies that were published from Washington so far have a mortality rate of, uh, of in that range. So the, uh, the questions are the same to Nabil. And they know that we work uh, both in the same place, but I also work in Chicago. So uh, in Fargo, do you anticoagulate all patients who come to the intensive care unit? Well, the answer for that is no, not all patients should be anticoagulated. I think we'll be seeing more complications than we, uh, and that's not what we do, yeah. And what about a subgroup of patients? Would you be selective in your anticoagulation to those patients who are at higher risk? Yes, uh, I think, I mean, personally, this is what I've done, and I think I, I, I understand our colleagues here in, in this city are doing the same. I think if I have a patient who has this worsening hypoxemia, rising D-dimers, um, 
and, um, and, 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 and in the absence of really what looks like a, a severe ARDS picture on the x-ray and worsening fibrosis, I think that type of patient that you categorize uh, when you talked initially about the pathophysiology, that middle ground patients uh, who has a severe hypoxemia with the high VQ, I think that type of patient uh, probably, uh, this is what I would do. And, and actually in, in several patients, when I was uh, uh, looking at them, I felt that anticoagulation is the best. Uh, the other category of patient that I think we should anticoagulate is patients on CRRT. I think we, we do use some sort of anticoagulation to keep the circuit, but it seems that these patients need higher doses. And based on experience of many, not just the reported studies that I discussed today, uh, that more anticoagulation is needed. Uh, do you allow me to chip in, uh, Mazen? Go ahead, uh, Hassan. Just with the last point that uh, Dr. Abushala was mentioning about the use of uh, CRRT. So it seems that these patients have two problems. You have the clotting that's been generated by the procoagulable state that they have. And in addition to that, they have clogging of these circuits with the amount of cytokines that going through the filter. In my limited experience with these patients, uh, when you increase the pre-dilution uh, and with systemic uh, heparin, then the incidence of thrombosis comes down quite significantly. Thank you very much. I just uh, shared the uh, results of the poll that I posted. Uh, and you can see that uh, so far uh, we have uh, uh, Twenty-three percent would use uh, D dimers, uh, and the, the level would be one thousand nanogram per mL. And twenty-three percent. Uh, this is multiple choice, by the way, so it doesn't add all the way up to one hundred percent. So there is more than one choice you can do. So, but at least nobody said not at all. Said so they all agree that they want to use some type of uh, anticoagulation for those patients. Uh, I would probably myself, because the same question I asked myself is like, should I anticoagulate all those patients? And the answer is no, but based on uh, certain criteria, we should. At Tarash Presbyterian Hospital in Chicago here, the criteria is defined as the following. One of the following, either hypoxemia with uh, requirement of oxygen six liters and above. And number two, is uh, acute lung, uh, acute kidney injury, and number three, uh, six-fold increase in the D-dimers. If this one of this criteria is fulfilled, at that time, full anticoagulation is advised uh, for those patients. Uh, so you can see that 46% uh, they would be waiting for uh, uh, organ-induced uh, dysfunction, and uh, we have 23% would give it to all uh, patients. Uh, I think we have to be very uh, uh, careful here because we're going to have some uh, complications associated with full anticoagulation and uh, we may not uh, uh, cause uh, uh, good to those patients. Uh, we certainly do not want uh, to cause harm to our patients. Uh, may I uh, say some, uh, something, uh, Mazen? So based on this criteria, really, uh, we are seeing in these patients, especially when we, before we started learning about how to tackle the ARDS. We've been dealing with it just like the orthodox ARDS. Try to keep the patient dry as much as possible. In COVID patients, we are noticing that this is sending a lot of patients into AKI, and that's probably can be problematic in the criteria that you mentioned, because if the AKI was due to the dehydration that you have inflicted on the patient, rather than the microthrombi that's causing the uh, AKI, then probably that would be uh, dangerous thing to do. The other thing, did I hear you correctly? The FI2 six liters and above? Yes, for hypoxemia, acute kidney injury, or uh, incre six fold increase in the D dimer. So uh, that's the other thing. So probably we are talking outside the ICU because <laughs> in our hospital, no one crosses the ICU uh, step without having been Correct. on uh, 12 liters of oxygen or more. Well, this is a no normal uh, uh, practice, actually, when we don't have high level of uh, evidence. So people yeah. will look at it from different perspectives, and uh, they would apply it in different situations. Uh, and that's why we have 
Now, multiple uh, protocols or guidelines, whatever you want to call it, it's not high level protocols and guidelines should be based on high level of evidence. We don't have that high level of evidence, but uh, that's why you see that everyone is doing it differently. Till we get more uh, further studies, uh, more data to support one uh, protocol or another. Uh, uh, Dr. Khirallah uh, uh, Balfouja uh, wants to ask questions, so I'm going to give him the mic. Uh, if you would bear with me a bit, please, uh, to get back to. Okay, you can talk now, Dr. Khairallah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, so, uh, if we will, uh, my question about this anticoagulation. If we will start uh, the therapeutic anticoagulation, which I think is indicated for uh, mainly for a patient with the high uh, D-dimer, and you could talk, it's variable 1.5. Uh, some people consider three uh, and other uh, six uh, fold. What's the, uh, the duration? The duration of this uh, therapeutic anticoagulation will be guided by uh, the level of uh, the D-dimer or clinical, uh, Evolution, or what? What do you think? What's your advice? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, very uh, difficult question uh, because uh, nobody agrees that we should anticoagulate all patients. Number one, so the most difficult part would be uh, number one, which anticoagulant, and number two, how long we're going to uh, anticoagulate those patients for. Uh, I don't have an answer to this question. Uh, we're uh, hoping that uh, organ functions get better and uh, make that decision case by case. Uh, we have not set a, a duration for anticoagulation. As long as those patients are sick, they will uh, continue to uh, have the inciting factors for uh, coagulation and they should be on anticoagulation if uh, the, the anticoagulation is going to help them. I'm not sure if Nabil uh, uh, would add anything, uh, if you uh, have come across any duration in terms of uh, the anticoagulation. Uh, I believe that I came across a couple of recommendations about five to seven days. Uh, you could use D-dimers, but, but again, it's uh, once you start the anticoagulation and the these numbers may be affected, but uh, but five to seven days is the average. And I think if you're doing it for patients on CRRT, then you can do it as long as they are requiring CRRT uh, to continue using anticoagulation. So it's, it's uh, again, there's no specific guidelines. People have been arbitrarily making uh, uh, sort of decisions about how long to do it. Once you decide, I think it's, uh, you, you have to individualize the patients and see how they're responding to it. Hassan, do you have any uh, insight about yeah. that? Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, I didn't come across any recommendations, but it strikes me that at least we want to make sure that the patient is out of the infection uh, and improving. But the other point is really monitoring these patients uh, can be difficult. Uh, a lot of hospitals reported in London or a few uh, it has been reported in London that they are using uh, anti-factor uh, uh, 10A assay to monitor uh, the heparin therapy for these patients, especially when they are on uh, CRRT, because they are finding it's, it's really difficult to monitor these patients uh, appropriately uh, the usual way, especially uh, when at the start they have raised APTT, and probably according to the French study that Dr. Abu Shala shared with us, probably these patients already have lupus and coagulants, and probably we have to uh, expand the 
investigations to include low placental arguments uh, uh, of these COVID-19 patients. I want to draw your attention, Mazen, to a question by Dr. Uh, Adil Hussein. Uh, I think I've seen it somewhere. It yes, uh, I, I want to, uh, there is uh, a comment uh, made by Dr. Ahmed Balshi. <clears throat> if uh, the criteria you mentioned more than six liters, uh, then all patients who are ventilated, meaning oxygenating probably, oxygenated, should receive full anticoagulation. And, and that's, yes. And any patient who's, uh, who's needing uh, oxygen uh, uh, above that level. Uh, and in fact, actually, I just looked at it again. It's, it's four liters and uh, higher. This is a Trush Presbyterian hospital. Uh, so that means all patients uh, will have, uh, and, and I'm just giving you how people are actually interpreting the, uh, the data that we have and how they are applying it. Uh, I'm not saying that this is what we should do. What I'm saying is this is what they do at uh, Rush Presbyterian Hospital, and they will end up having almost all patients uh, who are requiring oxygen at uh, more than uh, uh, this level uh, with uh, anticoagulation. Whether this is uh, right or wrong, we don't know. I think we will know uh, very, uh, very shortly. Uh, the R2, I think uh, we did not present that slide. Uh, the uh, there are three uh, randomized control trials right now. If you go to clinical uh, uh, trials.gov, you will uh, be able to find that there are uh, three under, uh, ongoing uh, trials. And we're probably going to, it's not going to be easy to recruit patients into those trials because people are uh, wanting to give uh, the treatments, not the placebo. So we will see how long it's going to be uh, taking them before they can uh, get uh, us some data. So what was the question, uh, Hassan, that you found? So Dr. Adel Hussein, uh, it's on the Zoom uh, webinar chat. Uh, he's asking, great job, Dr. Ibrahim. He's saying Hassan afterward. <laughs> Thank you, Adel. Right. Uh, in case of suspected hit, what are you going to use for both prophylaxis and treatment as it's not mentioned in the protocol? Uh, a great question. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, there has been some difficulty monitoring the heparin and people already moving to bivalaridine as a substitute for, uh, for heparin. And probably that can be used if you had a patient diagnosed with HIT. The second question is saying incident uh, of VTE development on prophylactic dose only in high risk COVID-19. I'm not sure I understand the question, but we know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and from Dr. Arabi's paper that uh, in the controller group, he did have patients developing uh, VTEs despite being on, uh, on uh, pharmacological uh, DVT prophylaxis. And um, so I suspect these patients would be even sicker than Dr. Arabi's group. The all COVID-19 are scoring very high on the Apache score and the SOFA score. Great. Thank you. So I, we do have some questions here on uh, YouTube channel, uh, and I'm trying to screen uh, through the questions related to anticoagulation because I do have other questions. Now, uh, one, one of the questions say, if the idea, if the idea of microthrombosis, why not small dose thrombolytic therapy, whether inhaler or IV, thank you. I found contra contradiction between uh, uh, caution about intracranial hemorrhage and uh, recommending using full anticoagulant coagulation following London's criteria. This is from uh, Yasser Tulba. Uh, Hassan, can you uh, understand the question? I found contradiction between caution uh, about intracranial uh, hemorrhage. Uh. Uh, hi, yes, sir. I'm not sure I understood his question uh, because he has to remember they are basing their recommendations uh, on the weight. So these patients, if they are really overweight, as you know, in, in the UK anyway, uh, the general recommendation to double the dose of uh, enoxaparin. But here the Imperial College added the uh, D-diamond into the equation and suggested even higher doses of enoxaparin than usual. But this is still not therapeutic doses. Uh, uh, yes, sir. so we haven't got to the therapeutic uh, level. Okay, and Ashwak uh, is uh, is asking about uh, uh, thrombolytic therapy. Nabil, did you didn't you share with us uh, 
one article about uh, using TPA in, uh, in uh, COVID-19 patients? Yeah. Yes, I think one of the uh, paper published, uh, I think exactly what uh, uh, Dr. Ashwa mentioned here in our question is that uh, physiologically it makes sense to give these patients thrombolytic therapy, maybe at lower doses. Uh, so I can't remember the exact location of the center, but uh, one of the centers are giving low dose thrombolysis uh, for these patients, uh, for all their patients that have elevated D dimer or DIC criteria. I know that's a very aggressive approach. Uh, we don't have any data on outcome. Uh, I would be very careful about uh, this option uh, as much as I liked, or I use some time thrombolytic therapy for patients with pulmonary embolism when it is documented and it's causing you know, hemodynamic compromise. But I think uh, to give it as a blanket, even though it makes physiologic sense, I would be very cautious. Okay, another question here is uh, regarding the choice of anticoagulant. Uh, what about oral anticoagulation with uh, direct uh, uh, factor uh, 10 or thrombin inhibitors? I believe one of the studies I've seen is recommending rivaroxaban uh, or some of the new agents uh, like abixaban. Uh, depending on the patients, uh, if you if you don't have renal failure, uh, but the majority recommends the use of uh, low molecular weight heparin injections, particularly uh, in oxaparin. Correct. Uh, I just want to say that also there's something uh, in relation to uh, heparin, uh, unfractionated heparin, because there's uh, uh, been theories about uh, its anti-inflammatory uh, action in. Uh, in COVID-19 and uh, the ability to inhibit uh, the further uh, <coughs> clotting along with the anti-inflammatory uh, uh, effect. However, uh, the choice of uh, an exoparin is based uh, on the fact that if you use uh, heparin infusion, the nurse has to go in and out uh, so many times inside the room to adjust uh, the uh, titration of the heparin and that would increase the risk of transmission to healthcare workers. For that reason, since we don't have enough evidence, Ashray, to say the anti-inflammatory uh, action of uh, heparin would be associated with good outcome in those patients, uh, therefore the uh, uh, enexaparin is uh, the drug of choice. Uh, but I want to mention also that the, the, the dose needs to be adjusted in uh, patients with cre creatine clearance of less than 30. So you need to uh, pay attention to, to that. Uh, can you advertise about the events? Oh, that's, uh, he does discovered it uh, suddenly. Well, uh, social media is what we use and the uh, event was advertised on uh, five days ago. I'm sorry, we will uh, do better job next time. Uh, is there a role for uh, agrotapan uh, as an anticoagulant? Uh, uh, you probably answered that question, Nabil. Uh, we, we don't know about uh, the other uh, anticoagulants, so uh, we will need more uh, data about that. <clears throat> it, there is a possibility of role. Uh, there are other questions not related to our topic here. I will leave till the end, but uh, I just want to screen through the ones related to the anticoagulation. Should we do prophylactic low-dose aspirin during the pandemic for normal people if they are not on, uh, there's no in, in, in contraindication. <laughs> Hassan? Well, <laughs> uh, people are exploring this, uh, but still there's no general guidance uh, to, to adopt uh, this recommendation. But uh, I came across uh, some articles to suggest this uh, indeed. Excellent. Okay. I, I, would, I, I want to comment on this. I think one the things that worries me about aspirin is that the majority of patients we see with COVID-19 are thrombocytopenic, um, majority of them. And I think it's if they were already on aspirin uh, beforehand, I think that may be a, uh, sort of a, a difficult and combination. It's, uh, it's interesting. Seen a lot of uh, pulmonary uh, hemorrhages too, so complications will occur. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Hassan. It's interesting, Nabil, uh, from your experience that from my own experience uh, so far, uh, I didn't have, I didn't see many of thrombocytopenia. I don't know whether the 
virus that hit the UK is different or uh, behaving in a different way. Uh, I've seen really staggering number of uh, D-dimers uh, and CRP, ferritin, but I didn't see that thrombocytopenia being an issue in these patients. Uh, out of nearly 26 patients that I've looked after in the last week, uh, maybe two of them had thrombocytopenia and they recovered actually, they didn't stay. And, and that's what we need to find out whether uh, different uh, part of the wards have experienced uh, the effect of this virus differently. You know that the mortality rate uh, is different in England uh, from California, for example, much lower uh, in California uh, compared to uh, other parts of the New York is uh, hit uh, very bad and mortality rate is higher. What about uh, vasoplasia uh, pathology? This is uh, another question from Ashwa. Uh, is there anything we can do for it? Uh, well, there is a, a medication that is not approved here in, in, in the States, uh, but it is approved in Europe. Uh, it has a property for vasoconstriction on the lungs because if, if, the, uh, uh, if the pathology is vasoplasia, so the answer would not be vasodilator. So uh, you don't use uh, iloprost or uh, epoprostenol or nitric oxide in early phases. This will probably help in ARDS like picture if you have uh, uh, increased pulmonary hypertension and, uh, and uh, vasoconstriction, which we doubt. That's why those can be used as a trial. But the medication that is pulmonary vasoconstrictor is almitridine uh, and, uh, and the medication is not available here for us in the States. Uh, any, any insight, Hassan, about this? Uh, it's mentioned actually by the webinar by Dr. Gattinoni that uh, they, he talked about it. I think it's theoretical approach only. Nobody has tried this medication. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of uh, its uh, effect being used here uh, uh, in England. Uh, I believe it. The, the study that uh, that I've seen uh, is in France. Uh, so probably I don't know if the Italian use it, but in France they use it. It's been used before for patients with COPD, but with no evidence of benefit. So I think it's uh, it's a very difficult to get medications. It's hard to prove that it may make a difference. So Yasser is commenting that he he believes uh, that aspirin and other NSAIDs are relatively contraindicated in COVID patients. So. Uh, I think this is coming from the observations by uh, uh, some uh, doctors in France, and this is endorsed by the Ministry of Health in France. However, there is a very nice uh, 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 correspondence in, in JAMA, I believe, uh, that, that we need more data in order to verify this. Uh, they do not think that this is happening, but uh, it needs to be verified before uh, it can be uh, uh, advice that uh, those patients should not use. Now, the, the, at the end of this uh, correspondence, they will say, if you if you have a patient with fever, try acetaminophen first. <laughs> Don't try NSAIDs. <laughs> but if you cannot, <laughs> if you cannot control the fever, uh, um, at that time, uh, they, they, they don't have any objection uh, about it. What about uh, methylene blue? Uh, uh, would it work for pulmonary vasoplasia? I don't know the answer to this. Anybody? I don't know. Uh, I didn't come across it. Maybe well, imagine there's a, an ID question for you on the Zoom chat. And we cannot, uh, we need a coordinator, Victor. Okay. <laughs> That's why I'm question? trying to help. Read it, read it for me. I don't, I don't have access yeah. to the chat. It's about the uh, incidence of uh, fungal infection. <laughs> of course, the, uh, it's about the uh, Dr. Tharwat uh, Aisa. Uh, where is the question? Thank you, Dr. Mazen and the rest of the panel. From your experience uh, with such patients, what is the incidence of fungal infections superseded COVID lung involvement? Well, I haven't seen any myself yet, uh, but uh, the number of patients that I've treated uh, for COVID so far, probably around 30 or 40 patients. So, uh, um, but I, I haven't also seen anybody, in fact, in, in, in the uh, New Orleans, uh, Orleans uh, autopsy, they didn't see any uh, secondary infections in, in the autopsies, actually. And, oh, uh, uh, and there's up to 14% in some of the literature that I've seen 
their uh, co-infection with other organisms. Uh, but I did not see specifically about fungi. Did anybody uh, see anything in that regard, Hassan or Nabil? Uh, no. no. I think it's, it's a very low uh, incidence, as you mentioned. Even the incidence of uh, actual bacterial pneumonia seems to be quite low in these patients. Uh, uh, and those who pass away usually die from the primary disease, not from the co-infections. Uh, it seems again, uh, <laughs> it seems again, Nabil, uh, the, my experience here is uh, different in terms of the incidence of secondary bacterial infection. It's really high. And these patients, uh, they hit the door and already the, the guidelines, the current guidelines, you start straight away with empirical uh, antibiotics as a community acquired pneumonia uh, uh, on top of the virus. Now, uh, Mazin, back to the uh, fungal uh, incidence or fungal infection incidence in these cases, I think people are extrapolating from other uh, uh, viral infections in the chest and they are saying that aspergillosis probably is gonna be a common thing with COVID. Again, I've not seen it yet. Uh, I've seen some candida here and there, but I don't think it uh, re represents a true uh, lower respiratory tract fungal infection. So far, but I did hear our microbiologist or ID mentioning that we need to be wary of these patients. Uh, I just uh, since you mentioned the different periods, I think Mazin, do you want to comment about the variation in the virus between China and the US and Europe? I know we discussed it earlier. Uh, can you say the question again? Maybe uh, can uh, cut off. Okay, I'm just asking if you want to comment about the variation of the virus virulence and types yeah. between the countries. Sorry, I can't that hear you guys. Uh, I don't know that it's a problem with my connection. Or... Let me just uh, mute uh, Rias, okay? Okay. Yes. Uh, I, I unmuted Rias. I wanted to see their experience at King Faisal Special Hospital, but he's not paying attention, it looks like. Anyway. Uh, the uh, well, we don't know yet. We know that there are three uh, strains. Uh, there are more than 200 uh, mutations more. Uh, I cannot keep up actually with the mutations of the virus, but those are small mutations. They're changing only few antigens. So uh, they're not uh, reflected in terms of virulence remarkably. Now they're talking about three major strains, uh, the A, B, and C and different parts of the world had, were hit with different uh, virus uh, strains. So in fact, actually, I looked at the mortality per 100,000 uh, uh, population of uh, those countries, and I could not come up actually across any differences, uh, major differences, in terms of uh, mortality associated with uh, different strains. So I think we need more data. Maybe the distribution of these strains were very vague, Maybe there's a mixture of uh, strains also because the, uh, uh, the nature of, uh, of our uh, uh, communication and uh, uh, global spread of the virus is, is very, very uh, diverse. And probably we will have more than one strain in each. Uh, I cannot say that in New York is only uh, uh, connected uh, through to, to Italy uh, and it's not connected to the rest of the world. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but yes, we've seen different areas uh, with different uh, mortality rates so far. The other thing is we, we, the mortality rate is related on uh, the spread of the test. So if you're, if you're testing so many people in the community, the mortality rate is going to be very low because you're testing uh, those mild cases uh, compared to if you are selective in your uh, testings and you are only testing these difficult or the severe cases, the mortality rate will be higher because now the mortality rate is uh, based on the total uh, number of confirmed cases. That's why we need to switch from the mortality rate to the confirmed cases to mortality rate to the population, to 100,000 uh, 100, of the population. This will give us better comparison in terms of the uh, mortality rate between uh, or among countries. Uh, so more data to come. Uh, there are so many questions actually I need to uh, uh, I don't want to uh, ignore any of them, but uh, one question was uh, in regard of uh, uh, hyd dehydrating those patients to the level that the sodium was up to 175, and the attending physician kept saying, we need to keep those patients dehydrated. We need to keep them on the dry side, otherwise they die. And I don't know what did he say about this patient eventually. 
So uh, Hassan, you mentioned something about that, and this is your own experience also, that those patients are ending up with acute kidney injury. And we're, we're not following this. Uh, we're, we're using ourselves here, we're using uh, hydration based on hemodynamic uh, targets. So, so what's your experience? Uh, looks like Hassan is muted. Hassan is muted and he's not talking. Did you hear the question, Hassan? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I heard the question. Yeah, exactly. I totally agree. We are for these patients. Probably we should be aiming for eovolemia rather than uh, hypovolemia, as we would normally with the usual uh, type of ARDS. Okay. And I try to use all uh, the uh, gadgets that I have to assess the hemodynamics, including yeah. the volume view or the peak of. Okay, so I want uh, to, to follow up on uh, Dr. Ahmed Zahir. Uh, he said, if the patient is discharged, will he be staying on anticoagulation? I don't think so. We're talking about limited time in the, in the hospital. I said, we don't know how long we're going to do this, whether five, seven days, or for the duration of the severe illness. So Nabil is suggesting that uh, most of the people recommending five to seven days in the hospital. I say that as long as we have severe illness, they should be anticoagulated, but very carefully in the hospital. I don't think any, nobody knows the answer to this, to this question. Uh, Selma Bakhet, uh, is there any possibility, possible treatment for pulmonary? We answered that actually. Role for thrombolytic therapy in COVID-19, we answered that uh, with, uh, with uh, ACS. I think there's uh, one, uh, one uh, letter in JAMA also about the acute coronary syndrome uh, and COVID-19. Now, is there any value uh, or target of how much you want to thin the blood. Like in PE, you have set a target INR. Uh, you want to answer this, Hassan? Uh, we, we know that we're using different methods in order to, uh, to anticoagulate those patients because what we learned that they re really need higher level of anticoagulation compared to the normal uh, patients whom we uh, anticoagulate for different reasons. And uh, I, I know that there is a study at, uh, at uh, uh, MD Anderson and uh, Baylor College about using TEG in, uh, in those uh, uh, patients uh, to monitor uh, for better anticoagulation. And you mentioned something about the NTXA. Go ahead, Hassan. Uh, uh, actually, and so far we didn't have any patients who got diagnosed with PE or DVT that required or managed to come out of the ICU to decide about giving them oral anticoagulants. But I would have thought we should aim for the higher side of the of the usual target, uh -huh. uh, indeed. Correct. Uh, but I'm not aware, um, I think he's mentioning that in London, uh, uh, saying that the, the target is a three, or, so I'm not aware of uh, any targets so far. Okay. Can I comment ahead, on David. this, uh, and then, um, I think some of the publication talk about even if you're using IV heparin, not low molecular heparin, that the PTT is not reliable in COVID patients and may be falsely measured or, or the, the results are not reliable. So if possible, even if you're using this, that we should measure factor 10A activity to monitor anticoagulation rather than the PTT. If that's possible, there is some data to suggest that it is better. I agree, especially with the rate of uh, lupus anticoagulants uh, that uh, you have at 88%. Anyhow, uh, thanks, okay. Some hospitals give uh, three heparin ampoule twice daily. We don't do that. Uh, uh, you need to monitor this. You cannot just uh, give uh, arbitrary dose you, yeah, I, I would use just uh, low molecular weight heparin, uh, which is more predictable than the heparin. Uh, would, you, uh, would you agree about that, uh, Hassan or Nabil? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I think probably he meant uh, the 5,000 uh, unit of heparin three times daily, which is an alternative way to inoxaparin. Uh, I, I think I wouldn't have any issues with that, uh, but we need to be mindful and go. I would recommend the Imperial College guidance on this. So probably you need to double the dose of the heparin uh, if the weight is high or if the uh -huh. V-dimer is sky high. What about antiplatelets? 
I think we answered that, right? Yeah, we did. Uh, there is a high incidence of AKI in COVID. Is it uh, safe to use an extra parent? You need to adjust the dose once the creatine clearance less than 30. That's I can comment on this. I think it's because of the, you, uh, that was a brought up as a question before the conference. Uh, there is, I mean, even though we normally don't use an exopharin, but there are data that you can use it in dialysis patients. You have to adjust the dose. And I think if you look up at the several references about somewhere between 0.7 to one milligram per kg per day. So once daily, that would be the dose for patients on dialysis. Okay, uh, yeah, we're going to answer the questions about uh, uh, somebody is asking about uh, something not related. I will get back to that, so uh, no problem. What uh, what are what's protocol for this? We use direct anti. I think we answered that. What is the best vasopressor? So uh, based on vasoplasia, we answer that. I believe aspirin and other NSAIDs are relatively contraindicated. Okay, what about, wow, it's jumping down actually. So many questions, let me just go back. Uh, what about methylene, we answer that. Okay, is there any study? Uh, we answer that. How common unilateral infiltration on, in COVID-19? I've seen two cases so far. The uh, left lung uh, is uh, it's the clear uh, infiltrate. Uh, completely unilateral, actually. But I've seen so many focal infiltrates. Uh, presentation can be of anything, actually. There's no typical presentation, but mainly it's a uh, ground glass uh, uh, appearance on the CT scan, uh, focal infiltrates in peripherally, but you can have focal uh, pneumonia, consolidation, bilateral uh, interstitial infiltrates, ARDS like mixture, any infiltrates can be, uh, uh, patients can present with any infiltrates. We know that any other, other thing, Hassan or uh, Nabil? No. Okay. Uh, you know, it's just peripheral, really. That's the striking thing about correct. it. <laughs> correct. Uh, and that's actually in the beginning. If they progress, it's bilateral. So there's no specific pattern. We know the mechanism and benefits of chronic ARDS. How can you explain dramatic improve, improvement in early stages? Well, it is not dramatic improvement, actually. Yes, some patients may improve. And that's why we, we do it. What we say is, let's just do self-proning uh, trial uh, for those patients. Now, why they're getting better is because we're changing the gravity for the patient and the blood flow is changed. So uh, you flip the patient and then the blood flow would go somewhere else. What we notice also that they improve for a few hours and then they uh, uh, deteriorate after that and they, uh, they become hypoxemic. Flip them back, they get better. So it is actually we're playing with the blood flow based on the gravity and the, uh, the different pressures applied to the, to the lungs. So uh, any ideas uh, from your side, Hassan or Nabil? Um. Yeah, I, um, this uh, the proning effect is amazing. Some patients immediately from PL2 of 6 kilopascal, they jump to 12. And when you <laughs> uh, reposition, deprone them, as they say here, then they, they, they really go bad again. Uh, it's really fascinating. I really don't know the, the exact mechanism. Right. Uh, and, and also, if they don't get better with the uh, first proning, do not bother and do it uh... Uh, and ask the patient to keep doing it because patients are not happy with this. Uh, imagine yourself like uh, uh, sitting on your stomach for a long time. Now, a question here, here any improvement after anticoagulation in PF ratio uh, uh, for the acute kidney uh, injury incidence? I want to uh, say that here where I practice in Chicago, we're doing anticoagulation on all patients, I'm sorry. <laughs> so the patient, <laughs> the minute the patient comes, the anticoagulation is started. Uh, well, we have good results so far in terms of mortality, 13% uh, our mortality rate, but we still have patients in the, in the ICU, uh, so we don't know. I haven't seen that, you know, I start anticoagulation and PF ratio gets better. I did not see that, actually. I've seen that patients are not progressing and not uh, worsening, but it, there's still so much to learn from those patients. Uh, you so, know, I so have... we will be... We will be your control uh, arm <laughs> of the study. <laughs> right. Uh, 
the I want to virus... say, I mean, regarding the hypoxemia, Mazin, that question, it's going to be similar even if you're treating a patient with PE. If you give them anticoagulation, they don't, their oxygenation does not improve. So you really, unless you're going to use thrombolytics and, you Correct. know, or macro thrombosis, you might see an improvement. Mm -hmm. in the Whatever injury occurred, it's occurred over the days, you probably prevent further uh, injuries. Right. What's the final word uh, uh, in using ACE inhibitors? Uh, do you want to answer uh, that question or you want me to? I think you. Uh, okay, so there is no final word. <laughs> <laughs> yet uh, uh, there's there's uh, uh, recommendations uh, based on what we know so far. If the patient is on S inhibitors, keep the patient on it. If the, unless there is a reason uh, for for you to stop it because of uh, of uh, hypotension. At the same time, do not start uh, uh, ARBs uh, for those patients. Uh, I think we need more. The physiology is very complicated. Uh, I don't think it's time for us to discuss it. But uh, in general, uh, do not uh, change anything. If patient is on those medications, continue. And there's also very nice uh, uh, correspondence uh, uh, in JAMA. Uh, any experience with uh, antivirals, remdesivir? Remdesivir has uh, uh, been studied in multiple uh, clinical trials. Uh, uh, we need to see the results, but there's a very nice uh, study in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, looking at the compassionate use of uh, remdesivir and the mortality rate with in ventilated patients, and it's only observational study. This is uh, no comparison, I think. They just uh, looked at the mortality rate, it's 18%. And in all patients together, it's 13%, which is much lower than the mortality rate that we've seen uh, in other uh, studies but this is study is only observational. So we need to, to know more about it. It looks like it's promising medication and hopefully the uh, randomized control trial will, uh, will show us much. Uh, the best uh, browning based on your experience, uh, I don't know what, what you mean by that. Uh, uh, if patients intubated, uh, we do it for 12 to 16 hours. And uh, we, what we do here is we start at uh, 4 p.m. So we, the nurses at night do not have to flip the patient back. And then next day at eight o'clock uh, in the morning, we flip them back uh, uh, if they are intubated. For patients self in, uh, self uh, proning. Uh, oh, by the way, if you do patients on the ventilator, you have to move the head right and left every two hours uh, also. Uh, patients who are self uh, proning, uh, we ask them to do it for at least two hours. Uh, and, and most of the patients are not complying with what we want. Uh, they don't like it. Uh, uh, there's a question on recruitment maneuvers. Go ahead. Uh, sir. <laughs> yes. So this is a question talk about how many times you do recruitment maneuvers per day on the ventilator and on the same patient. I think the SCTM guidelines talked about it, uh, and uh, this is, as you know, one of my favorite things to try on the patients and see if it's responsive. So despite the two sort of uh, quasi-negative trials that were published uh, a couple of years ago and last year, uh, the SCTM recommend that we do a recruitment maneuver probably in the uh, phenotype uh, Edge, which is the, the stiff lungs. Uh, so those patients, uh, but they don't recommend the stepwise increase uh, of the peak levels of the pressure, but doing just a sustained 30 second uh, high level of peak somewhere between 30 to 40 centimeters. And if your patient improve, you can repeat it. If you don't see any benefits of the recruitment maneuver, then abort it. Uh, but there is a, a, a recommendation uh, and based on experience and based on, I think it's, uh, it's that it is worthwhile, but don't do the stepwise increase, just do the easy, sustained, uh, prolonged inflation and see whether your patients improves or not. Correct, thank you very much, uh, Nabil. Uh, I'm trying to screen uh, those questions again, make sure that we answered. Uh, uh, Nabil, uh, Mazen, there's a question uh, on the chat. Any comment on higher incidence of antiphospholipids, antibodies in COVID-19 patients with macrovascular thrombosis? Is it acquired? Oh, I think this is for Nabil to answer. <laughs> uh, Nabil, can you answer that yes. question? 
So this is uh, the, the antiphospholipid has been reported in two ways. One is a French study that I described that had a very high incidence, almost 80%. And there's also a case report in New General Medicine about patients with, uh, with positive antiphospholipid syndrome. So this is an, an still, I would say, single center study. Uh, um, uh, it's, I would say I'll be, you know, probably in the future, we should be screening patients. Maybe we'll see higher number than we thought, uh, but it's just way too high for me to see unless it's the, the COVID-19 does something with the testing. Great. Uh, so th there's a question about, I said a few questions outside the anticoagulation, question about uh, tracheostomy. And uh, uh, I think we worked on uh, a very nice protocol here at uh, uh, Sanford Health System with the help of Dr. Zurich and the surgical group. Uh, we're trying to delay this as much as possible, uh, but uh, uh, we were saying that three to four weeks uh, is the duration. We want to minimize the risk of transmission to healthcare workers. And we are requiring to uh, get two uh, swaps that are negative within 24 hours at least uh, before the procedure is uh, done. I think we run into a problem. I'm not sure if Kara Johnson with us. Uh, um, she was actually, let me just take a look here. Okay, so uh, we run into problem that when a patient continue to have a positive uh, PCR after uh, four weeks. So uh, sometimes we may have to uh, make a decision that those uh, tracheostomies uh, should be done. Of course, if the patient is high, on high PEEP and uh, high FiO2, I would recommend to, that's one of the question actually, I would recommend till uh, uh, patient gets better because uh, if he's still on high PEEP, uh, high FiO2, the prognosis is not uh, very good. Uh, and you're not going to get the patient anywhere. The purpose of getting the tracheostomy is, yes, we don't want to minimize the risk of uh, trachea stenosis, but also to move the patient outside the intensive care unit. Uh, if the patient is still on high beep, uh, oh, here, Dr. Zurek uh, is uh, saying, actually, thank you very much, Dr. Zurek, uh, is, is confirming four weeks if, if still positive. Uh, and that's what we agreed on. Uh, are we in need for every COVID patient to do echo? How uh, and how many times? Uh, uh, we, and in fact, actually, uh, our cardiologists are, are asking us not to uh, uh, request uh, echocardiographies for those patients. Uh, you know, the idea is please minimize as much as possible tests that do not add value to your management or diagnosis. So unless it's extremely needed, do not order any uh, extra test uh, for those patients. We're also trying to minimize the blood work, Minim trying to uh, at least uh, clump everything together, make uh, one plan for the whole days, like I want uh, this blood test today, and in the evening, uh, if you want to repeat any of the blood tests. Uh, but the idea of minimize risk for transmission to other healthcare care workers, and then select uh, the cases that uh, uh, that you have. There is one case of Guillain-Barré syndrome recorded uh, to be positive for COVID. In fact, actually, we have this case in Fargo also. So it's not more than uh, one. Uh, it's more than one case. Nabil, have you seen that patient with a Guillain-Barré syndrome? Who's? Uh, I think this is the one yeah. who's still uh, positive uh, uh, for for more for uh, more than four weeks. Go ahead, Nabil. Right. I think this patient uh, really had a bizarre presentation. I mean, he patient presented with ascending paralysis, and it was an incidental finding that he has bilateral ground glass opacities on the chest CT scan and got intubated because of uh, his muscular failure. And, uh, and then his studies were consistent with guillain -Barre. Uh And it was pretty severe to the point that it's, uh, you know, they remain on the ventilator dependent for uh, now, I believe this is the third or fourth week. Uh, and then as we discuss it with our neurology colleagues, I mean, it's sort of, uh, according in their literature, every single complications have been seen with COVID-19 as far as neurologic complications from strokes, uh, increased incidence to a lot of the neuromuscular complications. So I believe, yes, it can happen. Uh, with I mean, we know it with many viruses, but it's been to be quite reported with them. Um, uh, COVID-19. Okay, great. Uh, does uh, type L make it benefit from porn position? Uh, we answered that question. Anything else? Uh, do we have any more questions that we did not ask, we did not uh, answer? 
There's a question in the chat, steroids to be or not to be. I don't know whether you want to add it to us or. Let's, let's do this next week. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll do a webinar about uh, whether we should give steroids or not. Uh, it's a, a very uh, debatable also. <laughs> and uh, I, I, we don't know the answer to that. Level of uh, evidence uh, available for can, this can, is still low. Go ahead. Can, can I mention, uh, Mazen, uh, also there is a, a good guidance on tracheostomies uh, from in COVID-19 patients from the uh, BLA, so British Laryngoscopics <laughs> Association, and it's quite extensive. And I reckon it's uh, widely, it was freely available on the, on the internet. So if you say tracheostomy COVID-19 BLA guidelines, and it's fascinating the way they are attacking it. But as you said, Mazin, they are trying to delay it, but not by three weeks, they have two weeks. They're saying the PEEP should be 10 or less, FI2 should be 40 or less, and they are asking oh, the patient should be afebrile, CRP should be less than, well, it shouldn't be high. I can't remember the exact figure they mentioned. Okay. And they, some of them, I'm not sure this one mandated the swabs to be negative, but I think they are asking for that to be done as well. Okay. So I think uh, we uh, have answered uh, at least most of the questions. Uh, uh, it, I uh, really wanted to thank both of you. I'm sorry that uh, we uh, went beyond, but uh, we wanted to make sure that we uh, cover all uh, the questions so people can benefit from this as much as possible. And uh, please uh, be on the lookout for uh, our future uh, webinars. Uh, we'll try to do this uh, as often as uh, possible, but you all understand that we are all intensivists too, and we are very busy with patients. Uh, it's speaking up, uh, it's speaking up in, uh, in uh, the United States uh, within this week. So it's actually at the peak of our work. Uh, in North Dakota, it's going to peak uh, uh, later on in the uh, middle of May, end of May. So we will be busy between Chicago and uh, North Dakota. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thank you, Nabil. Uh, we have peaked already. Uh, <laughs> you're, uh, you're doing better so far uh, in England. So we are ahead of you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and I want everybody to, uh, to stay safe, please. Uh, practice uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the infection control uh, measures that are recommended. Make sure that you don't get into the rooms unless you are well protected, please. Uh, minimize your presence inside the room. Make sure that patients get what they need uh, in terms of uh, our care. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Hassan. Very, uh, uh, very insightful. Uh, thank you for your uh, uh, added value. Thank you for the article that you sent to us uh, uh, yesterday morning or today morning, probably forgot. That actually added so much. To the uh, okay. yes. And thank you, Nabil, for uh, putting those slides together. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for everyone who attended this and asked questions that uh, made it very rich. Uh, and all those will be staying on YouTube, so you can actually distribute it to everyone uh, around you so everybody can benefit. And if there are more questions, we'll try to answer this on the comment sections of YouTube. Thank you very much. We're going to end this. Uh, okay. Let's uh, reconnect together uh, after this, but I will send you another invitation. Thanks.